Whenever game developers start off with the creation of a new game, one of the first things they usually do is getting a character to move. This can be pretty straightforward. You have some kind of input device, capture user input, and make your character respond accordingly. However, as your project expands in scope, size, and complexity, you maybe want your character to perform various actions, such as climbing ladders or swimming. The catch is that the user input and the input capabilities remain the same, while only the in-game context changes. Let me quickly show you what I mean by that. For instance, pressing forward should make your character walk forward in an open field, but if they are on a ladder, it should make them climb up, and in water, they should swim forward. If you want to achieve behaviors like these, that means you have to manage information about your character's surroundings or what your character is doing. A common but naive approach, usually chosen by new developers, is to cram all this logic into one single script that's responsible for handling movement. For each single case, people use tons of if statements, and as a result, your code quickly spirals into chaos. Naturally, it becomes very easy to mess things up. Just picture your character swimming up on a ladder or climbing while submerged. And of course, you don't want anything like this to happen while driving a car. Not exactly the gaming experience you're aiming for. I hope, at least. What once was an elegant code base becomes a maintenance nightmare, prone to bugs and challenging to extend. And don't even get me started on distributing development tasks to your teammates. But there's a better way. Allow me to introduce you to the marvelous world of state machines. State machines allow you to encapsulate complex systems into manageable independent pieces. Think of it like defining separate states for walking, climbing, jumping and falling, instead of putting all those mechanics into one single place. Each state's code focuses solely on its unique purpose. While working on one state, you can completely disregard what other states are doing or what resources they might rely on. The climbing state doesn't need to know how long you charged up your super jump, for example. This architecture forces clean, maintainable code. Setting up a state machine based movement system requires a little more initial effort, but it pays off immensely in the long run. Just a quick disclaimer up ahead, um, there are various ways to implement state machines. Some use inheritance, some use interfaces, other ones use engine specific functions and there's a bunch of other stuff as well. I'm using Unity, but this should be really easy to adapt to other engines and other programming languages as well. What's crucial here is understanding the concept and why state machines work. Please don't put too much focus on the code that I'm going to show you. You should mainly focus on how the thing is working. And once you grasp the idea, you can choose an implementation that suits your preferences. I'm sharing the structure that I use in my projects. Let's begin with an abstract base class for all of our states, which I will call base state. This class represents the bare minimum any state needs to have. We have a construct method that is called when a state is entered, a destruct method that is called when we exit a state, and an update state method that is defining the state's functionality or what the state is doing. Every other state that we are going to create is inheriting from this base state. What we need next is an entity that is able to be in a state. In this case, it's our player character. For this, we create a new class, which we will call player motor, and it's a mono behavior so that we can attach it to our character object. In general, you could also create an abstract base class for this as well, something like base motor, so you can easily use this technique as well for enemies or NPCs in your games. For simplicity, I just stay with that one motor here. This player motor does have one field of type base state that is pointing to the state the character is currently in. This also means that your character can only be in exactly one state in any given time, and this is what we want. We also need to assign an initial state for this to work. Every frame we would like to update the state we are currently in. We also need to provide the possibility to change states. Transitions between states are typically triggered by specific conditions or events in the game, like a player pressing a certain key or reaching a particular game area. Create a change state function in the player motor class that takes a new state of type base state as a parameter. This function should destroy the old state, assign the new one, and set it up. In my case, I use current state.destruct, set current state to the new state, and call current state.construct. To show a little example, I have two states implemented, player idle and player move. 
player idle is my default state and inside its update state method, we are going to check if there's any valid input to make the character move. If we don't get any input like this, we are just going to stay in the state and nothing really happens. But if we're providing an input that should make the player move, we instruct the player motor to change to the player move state. And this player move state handles the movement code for us. Same thing in this state, as long as we're getting valid input, we stay in this state and continue to do our job. But if we stop providing this input, we are instructing the player motor to change back to the player idle state. The states should be able to call home to instruct a state change. So I usually create a field in my base state of type player motor and assign this player motor whenever I create my states. For simplicity, I also add access to my game input object and the character controller. Another way would be to instantiate all the possible states up front, assign this field once at this point and only change which state is currently referenced as current state. I also put some core functionality inside my player motor script that multiple states might need such as checking if the player is touching the ground, if the player is touching water, how deep inside the water the player is, maybe what kind of interactable is the closest at the moment and so on. This way you don't have to re-implement this logic in every state. And from there you can create transitions to other states and build your movement system framework. Each movement capability is encapsulated in its own context, making your code easier to maintain and extend. Bug fixes become simpler and the myriad of if statements used for determining behavior disappears as each state clearly represents the current circumstances. And as a bonus, this also facilitates the distribution of work among team members or planning your development process if you're working alone. And this concludes this video, I really hope you find it useful. If you would like to see a step-by-step -step coding tutorial on this topic rather than a short guide like this, please let me know and I'll consider making one. And if you have any questions or suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. Also check out my devlogs for my game All Hail the Squirrel Titan, where you play as a squirrel and build Max. And if you're interested, we may see each other again. Until then, um, yeah, good luck, happy coding and goodbye.